Good morning, City Cathedral. This is the day that the Lord has made, and I'm so excited that you are joining in with us in our e-service today at City Cathedral. We look forward to worshiping the Lord with you today, and in a few moments, you're going to hear a dynamic word from Bishop and then the praise team. But before then, I want to remind you that on this coming first Sunday, that's July 5th, you can meet us in our drive through Eucharist. If you're in the Woodlands area or the north location, you can meet us at 10 a.m. on July 5th for a drive through Eucharist. Or if you're closer to the Houston campus, meet us at 1130. Both are on July 5th at 10 a.m. at our Woodlands location and 1130 a.m. at our Houston location. But right now, I want you to grab everybody you can, share this broadcast, like it, follow it. Make sure that you're letting everybody know that it's time to lift up the name of Jesus with the City Cathedral Church. Now, let's go right now to the praise team who's going to take us even higher in the Lord. Good morning, everybody. your name at all times. I will praise you in the sanctuary. I will bless your name at all times. I will will praise you praise you in the sanctuary. I will bless your name at all times. I will praise you in the sanctuary. Sanctuary, I will bless your name at all times. I will praise you in the sanctuary. I will bless your name at all times. I will praise you in the sanctuary. I will bless your name at all times. I will praise you in the sanctuary. No matter what's going on, I'm gonna praise you. I'm gonna praise you. Not gonna worry. 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 I'm gonna praise you. I'm gonna praise you. I'm gonna praise you. I'm gonna praise you.
Come on and praise him. I feel something. I feel something. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Lift that music up. Come on. Praise him. Praise him. Lift that music. Praise him. Praise him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, praise him. Let's spend a moment. Come on. Let's give him a spiritual chat. Come on. Lock in, lock in, poke holes in heaven. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Ooh, yeah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We give you the praise, we give you the honor, yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, worship him wherever you are. You are in your home. Whatever location, know that God is omnipresent. He's right here. Hallelujah. Bless the name of the Lord. Bless the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hallelujah. I feel something. 
feel a strong anointing. hands I, I feel a touchdown anointing I feel a victorious anointing I feel a triumphant anointing Hallelujah. if if you have somebody standing beside you sitting beside you I need you to tap them on the shoulder and tell them you are a champion Thank him for your healing. Thank him for your victory. Thank him. Hallelujah. Oh, oh I feel a strong anointing. Thank you, God. Jesus. Jesus. Hallelujah. That's right. Go ahead and shout. Go ahead and dance. Come on. Cut a rug for the Lord. Go ahead and bless it. Go ahead and bless it. Shalom. Go on and worship him. Go ahead. Shalom. I came the blessing and I came to worship him. Yeah. yeah. My. Oh. Let me. Let me. Let me. Let me get to a moment. Let me get to a moment here. I know you're feeling it. I know you feel a strong anointing right where you are. The glory of the Lord is in this place. The glory of the Lord is in this place. I can feel him in the atmosphere. Put that reverie in, oh my God, put that reverie in your hands and give it a wave in the life of the Christian symphony and say, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can have what it says I can have. Today I will be taught the word of God. I boldly confess my mind is receptive. I'm about to receive. I'm ready to hear the incorruptible, irrefutable word of God. I will never, oh, shallow book. I will never be the same. Never, 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 never be the same in Jesus' name. Come on, give it a wave in the life of the Christian symphony. Oh, my God, praise team. Go with me to the book of Mark chapter 9, verses 2 through 5. It should be on the screen. The book of Mark chapter 9, verses 2 through 5. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up on a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses who were talking with Jesus. And old bold Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. Peter was very happy to be in the presence of the Lord. I want to use as a clarion to this little piece, part five, be loud and be proud. Come on, say it with me. <clears throat> Be loud and be proud. God bless you, musicians and singers. God's elect ones, we're delighted to have your face in the place once again. Oh, my God, if you feel what I feel, uh, you, you will know that it's a struggle to be still. I want you to underscore, I want you to underscore the word loud and underscore the word proud. This is part five, beloved. The word loud in the Hebrewic 
language. It's where you get the understanding room or the word room. R-U-W-M. It means to lift the voice or to make known or to become conspicuous. That word loud is to make known or to become conspicuous. The second word is proud. It's where you get the, 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 the Hebrewic word rakab, R-A-C-H-A-B, or the understanding to be roomy or spacious. So if you were to put both words together in its dichotomy, you would see that we must always make room for our loudness. Not in terms of an arrogant person, not in person of the word that is braggadocious, but in terms of lifting your voice, becoming conspicuous about your belief and salvation. Now, this is not me saying it. In fact, the word suggests to us in the book of Psalm, chapter 107, verse 2, it says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Your redemption give you permission to flaunt your faith. Those of you who are saved, you have a right to testify of your relationship with God. Don't be ashamed about that. Uh, don't be passive. Don't put that under some quilt. Let the world know that you serve a risen Savior, that you serve a true God, the true God, uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When I flunt my salvation or flunt my testimonial because of my relationship with God, I'm literally saying that I'm proud of my salvation, not because I'm fully delivered, but my yesterday really doesn't match my today. Because if my salvation is, is predicated on my yesterday stuff, on my past, then I lose my salvation. That my salvation is not based on past, based on better behavior, not because I've been perfect, not because I've been righteous in my own recognizance, but I am saved, I'm, 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 I'm saved and delivered and being delivered and being set free because of the grace of God. So I can make known, I can lift my voice, I can allow my loudness to become proud. Be loud and be proud and be proud of your loudness. Said with me, be loud and be proud. In point one, uh, beloved, we talked about excellence. We talking about we we said allow yourself to be excellent. In point two, we talked about existence in terms of living on purpose. I like to say life in session, and sometimes you just got to make that announcement, you know, to others that are busy knocking on your door of busyness. And sometimes you just gotta let them know that I'm in session today. Not from a selfish place, but from a clarity place, a clarion place, that I'm giving clarity. And I'm saying, listen, this is my day today. That I'm going to live on purpose. I'm not just existing, but I'm existing and living on purpose. And I've said it before, living on purpose is when you do unto you what others are demanding from you first. Said with me, life is in session. Then in part three and part four, we talked about equality. Mm -hmm. And what blocks equality is called racism and hate. And we know that's the climate around our world today. You've been hearing marches. Some of you have experienced marches. You've participated in marches and all of that. And racism is still here. But we're praying against that spirit because we know that racism is anti-God. And we should never embrace anything that is an opposite of God's will. Well, on today, in part five, I know that you're waiting on that. I'm going to talk about living an exceptional life as a winner, as a champion. Living an exceptional life as a winner, as a winner. And so there are three points that I want to rest my hat with. Number one, it should be on the screen. 
I want to deal with the attitude of a winner. The attitude of a winner. Number two, the athleticism of a winner. And number three, the association of a winner, a champion. The attitude of a winner. Number two, the athleticism of a winner. And number three, the association of a winner. And so, I want you to underscore the word winner. It is really synonymous to the word champion. I want to give you the Greek word for the word champion or even winner. It is called nikos. Said with me, nikos. It is N-I-K-O-S. Said with me, nikos. N-I-K-O-S. It means to be triumphant or to be victorious long before the battle began. You got to know that winning is intentional. You got to have an attitude of a champion. You have to have an attitude of a winner. Because if you feel like you're going to lose, you've already lost before the battle began. You have to have an attitude. Say it with me. It's all about the attitude. That's an old saying that it's not the aptitude, but the attitude that determines the altitude. Does that make sense? It's not the aptitude, and that's important, but it's more of the attitude that determines the altitude. How high you go is determined of the kind of attitude that you have. You see, wealth has nothing to do with money. Wealth has all to do with having an attitude of ownership. Now, I'm not here to talk about wealth, but I am here to talk about attitude. Say it with me. You have to be intentional in terms of having a winning attitude. You got to know that you are a winner. Say it with me. I'm a winner. Come on, you're not being arrogant. Come on, say it. I am a winner. I'm a winner. I'm a winner. I'm a champion long before the battle began. When you have that kind of mindset, then you won't come in agreement with aiming at nothing. Because when you aim at nothing, you'll probably hit it every time. Said with me, you have to have an attitude of a winner. You have to be intentional about winning. Come on, say it once again. You have to be intentional about winning. It has to be a part of your belief system. If you don't believe that you can win, then you won't try as a winner. The Lord wants you to be a champion before you win the race. Come on, tell yourself right now, I am a winner. Say it with me. I'm a winner. Say it once again. I'm a winner. You have to believe in yourself from that place. Now, Paul really gives us a great lesson about that. In fact, I want you to go with me to the book of Philippians. That's over there by Ephesians. I'm going to set something up because we're used to hearing the cliche read of the book of Philippians chapter 3 specifically in verses 13 and 14. I'm going to help you with that. Now, this is Paul talking, chapter 3 in the book of Philippians, verse 13 and 14. It's, it says, brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do know that I'm forgetting about those things that are behind me while pressing towards the mark. Now, that was the reason why he said that. There's a reason. The reason is really taken in verse 3 and 4. Same chapter in the book of Philippians, but verses 3 and 4, he gives the reason why he says that I'm going to forget about those things that are behind me while pressing towards the mark of the high calling. In verse 3 specifically, for it is we who are the circumcision, we who worship by the Spirit of God, who glory in Christ Jesus, who put no confidence in the flesh, though myself have reasons for such confidence, if anyone else think he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. And then he gives a detail why he has more uh, reasons to put more confidence in the flesh. In verse 5, he says, I've been circumcised on the eighth day 
that I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. I'm, I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews. I went about persecuting the church ignorantly, ignorantly, and I am more legalistic than anyone else. He says, but in verse 10, he says, but when I consider all of my past accolades, and he's giving a synopsis of his resume, of his accomplishments and accolades and acclamations and achievements. He says, but when I put all of those achievements together, all of those accolades together, in comparison to the surpassing greatness of knowing who Jesus is, he says, I just count it all as rubbish. He says, I'm going to forget about those things. You see that? That's behind me because I'm going to press towards the mark as a winner. You see, having an attitude of a champion is when you press as a winner. Look at your neighbor next door or just say it with me. I am a champion. I'm a winner. And when you have that kind of mindset, you're going to always press as a winner. Now, proof of your pressing as a winner, watch this, is that when you don't allow yourself or allow your success, your past success, to sabotage your need to stay polished, poised, and prepared, because the greatest science to winning is preparedness. You see that? So Paul says, I'm going to forget about my past achievements. I'm not going to allow what, what I've accomplished in my past life to mourn my need to press towards the mark of the high calling as a winner. Because when you do that, when you become preoccupied by pressing as a winner, then you will not allow your past success to sabotage, watch this, your need to stay poignant, poised, and polished as a prepared person. Because the greatest mythology or methodology of winning is preparation. Things just doesn't happen. They are intentional. So said with me, I must have an attitude of winning. Mm -hmm. I have to have a mindset that I am a winner. Number two, we must embrace athleticism. Mm -hmm. As a winner, there are some prerequisites that we have to do. In fact, go with me to the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I hope that you are getting this. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 and 25. Paul is still talking. We're just hanging out with Paul. It says, do you not know that in a race, all runners run? Well, that's a given. You can't be a runner unless you run. But only one gets the prize, the prize of a winner. He run in such a way as to get the prize. But look at verse 25. Everyone who competes in the game goes in strict training. Now there it is. Athleticism deals with if I am to be a winner, I can't be allergic to the need to train. I have to train. And it can't be some mediocre training. It can't be some mundane training. It can't be some minor training, ordinary training. The scripture says in verse 25, it has to be strict training. It has to be some hard training, man. You got to sweat. You know, I got some, I, you know, I have some cut buddies in the neighborhood and uh, before this pandemic, well, I used to go to the community center and didn't work out. I got to wait until all that is over. I ain't going right now. I hope that you're not in the gyms either. I hope that you're walking around your neighborhood and you have your little bicycle. You're doing something. You're putting some movement in your life. But before all of this, this corona piece, I would go and work out a couple of times in the gym. And I had some cut brothers that was not impressed with my pastoral. <laughs> and they would say, chase the burn, Reverend, Rev. 
you know, you got to work the muscles and you got to work those triceps and biceps and deltoids and all of that. You got to go in strict training because whatever you want to become, you have to be willing to pick up the condition or the prerequisite required in order to become or to realize the very thing that you want to see. Does that make any sense to you? So you have to go in strict training. What does that mean? Being a winner is not an automatic. It's not given. You got to get it. And it takes strict practice. Say it with me. Strict practice. Come on, I don't hear you. Strict practice. It takes intentional training. Working those winning triceps and those biceps and those deltoids and those loins, all of that, it takes strict practice because whatever you practice, you create, beloved, in as much as whatever you incubate, you cause to grow. Those of us who are praying to be a winner, and you should pray about that, it comes with the need to train. Because when you pray for rain, you got to deal with the mud. It just, it just goes together. Rain and mud goes together in as much as winning and training goes together like traffic and weather. So in verse 25, it says that if you want to go beyond being just an a, 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 a average runner, you want to run to win but you must embrace strict training. Say it with me, strict training. Come on, say it once again, strict training. And when you go in strict training, you have to hang around like-minded folk. You have to hang around winners. There's an old saying that winners of victory have a thousand fathers, but defeat is orphaned. And as much as we should never run behind an empty wagon because nothing ever falls off of it, you got to make sure that you hang around people who are winners. What does that mean? I'm hanging around folk um, who have as much to lose as I do. I'm hanging around people who have as much to lose as I do. Because if they don't have as much to lose as I do, then they'll mistreat your stuff. <laughs> so you want to make sure that with this attitude as a winner, you have to embrace athleticism. You have to embrace the need to go in strict training. And sometimes the strict training is when you become preferential of the people that you hang around. Say it with me. You have to become preferential of the people that you hang around. That's an old saying that we become the people that we spend the most time with. <laughs> so you want to hang around folk that are winners. You need to be hanging around losers because their mindset is different. You got to hang around people who have a winning attitude. Hallelujah. Because it's not the aptitude but it's the attitude that determines the altitude of, of how high you go. But lastly, the association of a winner is really taken in the book of Mark chapter 9, verses 2 through 5. Because winners never associate themselves with people who settle for substandard living but people of exceptional living. Let me say it once again. Winners never associate themselves with people who settle for substandard living, but rather they hang out with people who have this exceptional mindset. In verse 2, in the book of Mark chapter 9, Look at it. Jesus led Peter, James, and John to a high mountain. There he was transfigured. In verse 2, you can read it with me. 
Jesus led Peter, James, and John to a high mountain. This was not a low mountain. Ain't no such thing as a low mountain. But a high mountain. There he was transfigured, transferred. And the transference of detail was in verse 3. His clothes became dazzling white. In verse 4, there appeared before them Elijah, Moses, who were talking to Jesus. Boy, this was some type of theophany. In verse 4, in verses 2, 3, and 4 here, Jesus, he leads his companion, his closest disciples, Peter, James, and John, to a very high mountain. There he reveals himself. He become transfigured. His clothes became dazzling white. And that was some type of theophany in verse 4. That Elijah and Moses appeared before Peter, James, and John talking to Jesus. But look at verse 5. It was the daring Peter. <laughs> The cussing Peter. The Peter who had a little temple temper. But God used Peter. Hallelujah. Peter says, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. He says, let us build three shelters. One for you and one for Elijah and Moses. What does that mean? There are some things that, that can only be revered when you get in a place of elevation. There are just certain things that you can't see when we're living this mediocre life, when we're too low. I'm not saying in terms of being humble, but there are certain things that the Lord wants to show you, but we have to elevate our thinking. And there are some things the Lord wants to show us that's not privy to others. Now read the scripture. It says that it was Peter, James, and John that only saw the revelation or the transfiguration of Jesus, dazzling white clothes in full glorious form. Yet he was having a conversation with Elijah and Moses. Peter, James, and John saw this divine revelation. But you have to elevate your thinking in order to see it. Are you getting this? How you think about yourself and what others think about you as none of your business. That's the proof of your elevating your thinking is how you think about yourself and what others think about you as none of your business because if you enlist yourself as being uh, preoccupied with, with how others think about you then you are going to miss what the Lord is trying to show you my God look at yourself and just say it with me you have to elevate your thinking but you need people that have already been there to get you there. Let me say it again. You need people who have already been there to get you there. In verse 2, Jesus led them, Peter, James, and John, to a high mountain. Hallelujah. Jesus led Peter, James, and John to a high mountain. Jesus led Peter, James, and John to a high mountain. Come on. Jesus led Peter, James, and John to a high mountain because you can't lead me if you don't know where you're going. My God. Let me say it once again. Jesus led Peter, James, and John to a high mountain. But you can't lead me unless you know where you're going because if you don't know where you're going, you will never know when you get there. I wish I had somebody. And where you came from. If you've not been there before, it is important. You can't lead me if you've not been there before because you will never know when you get there. Hallelujah. Oh, let me say it once again. Jesus led Peter, James, and John to a high mountain because it is obvious in context that Jesus hung out 
in a place of high mountains. Uh, uh -huh. Proof, Jesus would hang out all the time in mountains. He went there to pray early in the morning. He would face the mountain. He would go in a solitary place. We've read it to replenish and refuel and recharge himself. You see, if I am to elevate my thinking, the revelation is I got to hang around people who are already elevated. Oh, I wish I had somebody. So, so Peter says, Rabbi, it's good for us to be up in here. Everybody won't prefer or like to see dazzling things because they are so preoccupied with the normal. You see, you won't be mesmerized with divine revelation or high revelation or dazzling things if we are comfortable with the normal. But it was Peter that spoke up. What happened to James and John? Perhaps they were not as impressed. Hallelujah. Perhaps they were not as mesmerized as Peter was. You see, we cannot become so comfortable with the familiarity because I've been hanging around Jesus. I'm more comfortable. No, 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 no. No, no. It was Peter. We must have the Peter-like mentality. We got to get mesmerized when the Lord show us some dazzling things. Hallelujah. He says, let us us build three shelters. One for you, Jesus, and one for Elijah, and one for Moses. In translation, what he was literally saying, he says, let us preserve this anointing. Let's preserve uh, this high place. Let's preserve this elevation. Let's preserve this high moment. Let's preserve. Let us live up in here. Hallelujah. I know that's, I know that's poor grammar, but let me just emphasize what, what, what Peter was saying, he says, I can get used to this. We've got to build a shelter. We've got to build a means to house elevated mindset. Hallelujah. To have an exceptional mindset, you have to make space for it. You've got to make room for it. Peter says, let's, let's make some room for this dazzling elevation. You have, to, you have to get comfortable with a winning mindset. You must get comfortable being exceptional. Let me say that once again. You must become comfortable in being exceptional. Let me say it once again. You have to become comfortable in being exceptional. What does that mean? That when I become comfortable in being exceptional is when I establish space for elevation. Say it with me. I'm going to give room. I'm going to be proud and loud. I'm going to be loud and proud. Proud and loud and loud and proud. I'm going to make room for exceptional. I'm getting excited. Come on, touch yourself and say, come on, give, give self some grace. Give space for grace and become roomy with living an exceptional life. Hallelujah. You are a winner. You are victorious. You already won and you already win before the battle begins. Hallelujah. Walk in your victorious place. You are triumphant. Hallelujah. You are a victor and not a victim. Hallelujah. You are a victor and not a victim. Hallelujah. Use your past as a classroom. Be loud and be proud. Hallelujah. But you must associate yourself around people that loves the wind. And so you may have to press the delete button to some people that you have become codependent with. Hallelujah. I ain't gonna press pause in terms of being comfortable with that kind of mindset. I'm gonna press delete and erase them from your circle of influence. Oh, yeah, you're going to pray for them. 
You're not going to be mean-spirited. You're going to be lowly. You're going to be loving. But it is important, beloved, that you have an attitude of a winner. Because it's not the aptitude, but it's the attitude that determines the altitude. I hope that you were blessed, child of God. I hope that you got this piece, a very simple message that I believe is going to challenge your life. Hallelujah. Faith coming by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord, but then how can they hear unless they have a preacher, teacher? And I hope that you've received this taught word, but, I think, but how can he teach, preach unless he is sent by God? I only have a few more minutes, but I want you to take a moment Get closer to the screen. I want you to take a moment, beloved, and I want you to press in. Those of you who are saved, I pray for your strength. I pray for your spiritual stamina. I pray that you will stay in the race. This race is not given to the swift nor to the, the strong, but he that endureth to the end. Hallelujah. Yes, you're going to get weak sometime. Yes, you're going to get lost in the sauce. Yes, you're going to get um, discouraged. But be encouraged, beloved, that all is well, that God is with you, that he didn't bring you this far to leave you. So I pray for those that are saved. I pray for your spiritual strength. I pray that his strength is made perfect in your weak place in the name of Jesus. Those of you who are unsaved, it is not God's will that you remain unsaved. Then his death would be in vain. For God so loved the world that he gave, he gave his life, hallelujah, so that we can receive the middle man, and that's Jesus Christ. He says, for I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father except by way of me, saith the Lord of hosts. And so his love committed him to give his life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, for whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. The Lord wants you to have this eternal life right now, right now. Right now, I'll be talking about next week, the keys to the kingdom. But the Lord wants you to live this life here on earth in route to your heavenly place. Hallelujah. So those of you who are not saved, it doesn't make you a bad person. It just make you next in line for salvation. Receive that salvation right now as many as received him to them he gave power to become sons of the living God hallelujah so repeat after me Lord Jesus come into my life I repent from my sins I ask that you will forgive me live in my life save me right now become my sovereign ruler my father my daddy in Jesus' name, I thank you right now. Say it with me. I thank you right now for saving me and satisfying me and sanctifying my life. In the name of Jesus, let this mind that is in Christ Jesus be also in you, that thou will keep thee in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. You are saved right now, not based on feelings, but based on fact. Because what the Bible says you are saved. Receive your salvation. Receive your new beginning. Presented for the first time, never been seen before. In Jesus' name. Let's rejoice right now. Let's rejoice. Let's rejoice. Angels are rejoicing for our salvation. They can't sing our song because they've never been saved. But they can praise God for your salvation. We thank God for Jesus. Thank you for committing yourself to Jesus Christ. You are saved. Now walk in that newness of life. Now those of you who want to give, hallelujah, I'm asking every person. In fact, I pray for an anointing of giving right now. An anointing of giving. Hallelujah. 
God wants you to have a giving spirit, the same giving spirit that he has. For God so loved the world that he gave. And that same giving DNA is in you, said God. Giving is of God. Hallelujah. Said with me, giving is of God. And so I pray right now for a strong anointing of giving, giving offerings and tithes. And those of you who want to pledge, I release a strong anointing of giving right now over the airwaves in Jesus' name. So call the number that's on the screen right now. Call our Houston campus. I'm here right now. It's 713-659-7750. That's 713-659-7750. And make your love gift. Call that number right now. Those of you who want to give online, that's citycathedral.com. Maybe you want to give cash pay. That's dollar sign City Cathedral. Maybe you want to bless me. Maybe you've been blessed from this taught word. You can give to me. That's dollar sign Leroy Woodard. That's dollar sign Leroy Woodard. You can give right now. Those of you who are in the further north area, our Woodlands location, dial that number that's on the screen. That's 281 292 5402. That's 281 292 5402. And those of you who are in the Sugarland area, call our Sugarland number at 281 298 7722. And I say a great hello to all of my Sugarland members, our Woodlands members, our Houston members, all of our elders and leaders. We say hello to my family, my wife, the first lady, and my two sons, all of you, my family, my lovely mother, God bless her, my in-laws, God bless them, hallelujah. My mother-in-law, I say hello to you too as well. Call the number right now on the screen. That's 713-659-7750. That's 713-659-7750. Those of you who are in need of prayer, I want you to call our prayer line. That's three or, or 605, I'm sorry, area code 605-313-5100. Area code 605-313-5107. Access code 1644-19-POUND. 1644-19-POUND. Hallelujah. Go to the phones right now. That's 713-659-7750. And give and be a blessing to this ministry. City Cathedral Church, one church in multiple locations. And to all of my sons and daughters in the ministry of KCCM, God bless you. God bless you. And go with Jesus. Brother Darian is coming to give you some very pertinent announcements. Brother Darian Lewis, God bless you. Hallelujah. Thank you. Come on over here. Come on. I know. Thank you. How are you? I'm good. I'm God good. bless you. All right. Y'all clap your hands and receive Brother Darian Lewis. God bless you. Thank you so much for tuning in and logging on to this service. It's a wonderful word. We want to remind you, though, that next Sunday you can join us in our drive through Eucharist at 10 a.m. at our Woodlands location and at 1130 at our Houston location. We want to see you there. You'll be able to drive up from the safety of your car and you'll be able to take in this Eucharist. It's already prepackaged, already safe for you to participate in. And we want you to come, bring your family, load up the car and join us at our Woodlands location, 10 a.m. and our Houston location. Now, I would be there, Darian, live at 10 a.m. at the Woodlands location and then live at 1130 at our Houston location. They still can log on and watch us at our regular All right. 9 a.m. Hallelujah. That sounds like a plan. Drive up Eucharist. Drive up Eucharist. Man, I like that. Drive up Eucharist. I have my robe on along with Pastor Allen and other ministers and elders and all of that. That's that's 10 a.m. at our Woodlands location and Houston at 11.30 a.m. live. I want to see you now. 
be sure to come. Be sure to come. Go ahead. Go ahead. God bless you. Thank you so much. And then also, don't forget to tune in on next Sunday. We'll be celebrating the L.J. Woodard Foundation uh, Scholarship. Yes. Yes. It's that time of year, and we're so excited to celebrate these young men and women as they make this major accomplishment. And so we're excited to do that. So tune in, and we'll be spotlighting them. And then all of our graduates and all of our students, we thank you so much for your hard work. We're yes. for you. Enjoy your summer. Stay safe. Don't forget to wear your mask and practice social distancing. Please do that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mask up. Come on, say it with me. Mask up. Mask up. Come on, praise team. Mask up. Mask up. All right. Then wash your hands. I'm, I'm just saying. Y'all be blessed now. Come on, take us out. Worship and praise team. Sister Bye. Regina, thank you. Brother Darian Lewis. Don't forget, You're on next Sunday, see your face in the place. Be blessed. Are. Don't be tardy for the it's party. Who you are. Hallelujah. Thank you. It's who you are. By you, it's who I am. It's who I am. Who I am. It's who I am. You are your good, good father. It's who you are. Perfect in all your ways. Perfect in all of your ways. Perfect in all of your ways. Perfect in all of your ways. To us. To Oh